Good morning, everybody. We have Grant Kemp today for Grant Teach Me Something, and we've got the absolute guide to owner financing, and we're doing this one live. This is one of our most well-played videos, several, like 20, 30, 40,000 views, somewhere in that range on YouTube, and it gets a lot of traction. And there was a lot of questions, so what better way to answer all of those questions than to go live with this class? So if you've ever had any questions about owner financing, this is the class to watch. Grant Kemp is bringing this one in and going deep dive on the absolute guide to owner financing. Grant, how are you doing today? I am doing excellently, fantastically well, as Andre 3000 would have said in Outcasts <laughs> 2001 hit, <laughs> whatever that was. Uh, yeah, man, I'm doing great. Thank you, guys. I've, I, you know, I've been in bed sick as a dog for like four days, and I did not get up out of bed until yesterday. And then we had a great stream last night, uh, the first of a mini series that we're doing with the NTAREI presenting uh, just kind of some some uh, webinars on what to do in this next series. So be on the lookout for that uh, as we're doing that every Tuesday night for this next five or six weeks, uh, doing little uh, uh, meetup groups on that thing. But like Daniel said, you know, this particular topic is going to be a huge topic for the next cycle. And it's something that everybody needs to understand how to do if you're going to be one of the guys that makes it instead of one of the people who's broken from it uh, in this cycle. And that's owner financing. We get a lot of questions about that. And like you said, this is, you know, shoot, we've had almost 40,000 views on this video whenever it was done as a lesson series. And what we wanted to do today is present this to you live and allow some of that interaction that we love about the, uh, uh, the, the, the social platforms that are available to us. So you can ask some questions that you may have had. So Ika, my assistant, is looking out on all of the streams, uh, checking for those uh, questions. So please interact with that. She will put the questions up as we go. But we want to get this information to you because this is how you're going to build a portfolio in this upcoming cycle. You know, Daniel, when people get into real estate investing, what do you think, what's the reason why people get in? What's the thing that everybody says they're in for? The universal answer that I almost always hear is they're looking for some form of freedom, whether it be freedom from mm -hmm. their job, freedom for choices, freedom for, for something. It's almost always freedom, which comes with the money that real estate investing can produce for you. So that is almost always directly where I see that answer lie. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the uh, and, and, and that's the thing that I want to uh, touch on here is because and forgive me as I'm getting this uh, shared out to a couple of people who have asked me for the link. I'm tag teaming here. That's the beauty of live. Um, you know, one gonna... of the things that is uh, uh, everybody says freedom and I always push back. You know, if I get the word freedom with what you're asking for, I always push back because freedom isn't a, uh, a definable Thing necessarily because what freedom means to you is going to be different to me, right? So um, uh, there is a, and I'm getting a, a, a report that our our stream is being choppy. Um, is it choppy coming in on the Propelio page or is it only choppy coming in on my Facebook page? I, I want to make sure that that's taken care of because we're going to do uh, we're going to do a very in depth lesson here. So I want to make sure that everybody's good to go. So let me uh, let me do this. It seems like it's the creative cash flow page. It's having some trouble. Uh, Daniel, do you happen to have a link, or Ika, do you have the link for um, uh, either Daniel or the Propelio YouTube or the Propelio pages uh, Facebook feed? Let's go ahead and just shoot everybody over to that so that we can make sure that they're they're being taken care of. All right, because um, on my side, meantime, just on on restream, restream just shows to be constantly connecting and reconnecting, reconnecting and reconnecting. Okay. so we might need to abandon yeah, that so one today. Yeah, we're gonna abandon that one. We'll move everybody over. If you're watching on or if you're watching on the uh, uh, the Facebook um, the Creative Cash Flow Facebook page, just go over to facebookcom uh, what is it groups slash the Propelio group, which it should already be a a quick button hit for you guys and uh, uh, and check out the live there because that one's gonna be uh, uh, it seems like a better stream here. Um, so yeah, so we got some, a few folks over there. Um, let me, I'm just going to share this real quick. I'm sorry. I want to make sure that everybody's getting, getting the link that they need, uh, for this. Ah, but I don't know how to do that. Crud. Well, if you're watching on creative cash flows page, just go to the Propelio page. It looks like their stream is working better than ours is. And we'll just abandon creative cash flows. Yeah. Just go to, um, just go to Facebook and search for the Propelio group and you'll see the stream live there. So we're good to go on yeah. that side. Grant. Perfect. I do yes. know that you being the master that you are of creative financing, that you've got an amazing show for us today. What are you going to be teaching us today? 
So today we're going to be going over what is owner financing, what is subject to, and how is that going to fit into your portfolio? The problem that people have is they, uh, um, they, everybody says they want to get in for freedom. And, and it's funny, I was interviewing somebody who's joining our creative executives group uh, today. I was interviewing him yesterday. And it was the first time that I used this analogy, but I think that it's totally true. And that everybody gets into to real estate and they say, I want freedom. And they say, I want a portfolio. And they say, I want cash flow. And they get on the ship and they build the ship and they're, they're, they're shooting forward for it. And then just like in, in the Odyssey, the siren song over here starts singing. And he says, oh, you can make $18,000 and it's really not that complicated. And everybody's like, Aah! and they pull over and they do wholesaling and they get stuck in a job, right? Because <laughs> wholesaling is a job. It is not a portfolio. <laughs> so we're all on this path to freedom and we get stuck in this really high paying, but very difficult in terms of it takes a lot of work and no, it is not. Uh, uh, yes, it is good to have a strong worth, work ethic, right? But all the Facebook bragging of like hustle grind, like is show, you're working too hard. If you're having to repeatedly do 50, 50 or 60 houses a year to survive, you're working too hard. Most people can retire off of 50 or 60 houses total in their portfolio and be making over six figures a year net in passive income. There's no such thing as passive. There's only varying levels of it. So what we want to do today is we want to put in front of you uh, how is it that you can actually go out and create that portfolio and create that freedom that you were initially looking for? Freedom can mean different things to different people. Freedom might be freedom of time so that you can spend more time with your family. It might be freedom to travel. It might be freedom for whatever other reason, but we want to help you achieve that freedom. And that's going to be done in my opinion, largely through subject to and owner financing. So we're going to dive in there. And Daniel, I want you to slow me down or speed me up whenever we're going through this so that we make sure that we're getting everybody uh, the education that they need on this. So all let's right. dive right in. So we're going to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, all right, let's get this going. I'm excited, man. Perfect. So let's look at, oh, you know what? I am reversed from what I thought I was. Okay. Let's look at our, our uh, uh, presentation here that we are going to go through. So subject to is the big phrase. And we get a lot of people that are almost confused on what that really means. And so what I really wanna point out is subject to is short for the phrase, I will buy your house subject to the underlying lien staying in place as is, okay? You can buy houses subject to many things. Uh, uh, the, the sub to moniker does not necessarily have to be uh, uh, sub to a mortgage staying in place. You might buy a house sub to uh, a roof inspection. Uh, go ahead. I was just saying subject to the tax. I've bought houses subject to the taxes. I've bought houses subject to IRS liens. I've bought houses subject to child support liens. I've bought houses subject to just about every kind of lien you could think of. Right, exactly. And so what we want to do is we want to, gosh darn it, I'm trying to get you my slides here like we had set up. I had it a little reversed there. Okay, perfect. Um, so we want to buy the house sub two. In this context, when you're hearing us talk about sub two in this context, we're talking about subject to the underlying mortgage staying in place. And that's the primary uh, uh, piece for the sub two side. So when we are in, uh, goodness gracious, there we go. When we are looking at the um, sub two moniker, I want to be very clear to everybody that this is not an assumption. Okay. Sub two is not an assumption. Uh, Daniel, can you tell me what an assumption is? I hope I can. I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I'll try. So whenever you're taking an assumption on, what you're doing is you're taking the seller's existing loan, you're reaching out to that bank and saying, hi, Mr. or Mrs. Banker, I would like to step in and put my name on this loan on behalf of the seller and remove the seller's name. I want to take this loan completely over and, and relieve the seller of their duties for this loan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so what that's going to do is that's going to report on your credit. You've got to go to the bank. You've got to put your uh, your credit on the line. You've got to talk to them and put your taxes out. And then again, you are liable. With sub two, we're buying the house subject to the underlying lien staying in place, which means we're leaving it just as is. Okay. We are not uh, uh, going in and putting our name on it. It's going to re remain in the underlying uh, uh, person's name, which means 
it's going to report on their credit. Right. That's that's a very important part of understanding this. This is going to report on their credit. So we need to be very careful to understand that when we're convincing somebody, I say convincing, uh, when we are in a situation where we are negotiating and buying in sub two, you've got to take this very seriously because these guys are trusting you with the future of their credit worthiness. OK, now we in return are actually giving them a huge benefit in that most of the time, like, hey, if you're catching somebody up from back payments, well, you're going to help their credit. Their, their credit, yes, this is reporting on it, but if you're all of a sudden you know, catching up their back payments and then making their payments on their, their behalf on time, you're helping their credit. It's going to grow, right? Their credit score is going to grow. This is also not a lease option, okay? A lease option is going to be when you don't get title until some sort of, of uh, thing has been taken care of for you, right? So like, what would be an example of why you might do a lease option or a contract for deed, Daniel? So lease options or contract for deeds are a great way of taking a property that the seller does is struggling to sell. Like it, it's a very, in my opinion, it's a very similar acquisition strategy to subject to as to what your buyers fall into or your sellers fall into in regards to the negotiation. Anything that you can do subject to, you could probably do lease option. But for me, I don't do a lot of lease options, so I'm not very familiar with them in the state of Texas. But overall, uh -huh. it's like somebody that wants to sell their house they're struggling to get it sold. They'd like to have someone else take over the payments. So what I essentially do is I approach the seller and say, hey, can I can I rent this from you with the option to buy it at some point in time in the future? And with that, you can do what's called a sandwich lease option and then turn around and do that exact same strategy to a buyer, but have a higher rental payment than your underlying seller. And you correct a spread, collect a spread like that. But for me, I don't see why you would ever do that versus a subject to. Yeah, you know, and I agree. There's there's actually, in my opinion, there's a lot of money that gets left on the table with a lot of uh, lease options. A lot of lease options are built around um, intentionally trying to get the person to refinance out of that lease option. And I don't want the person to refinance. You know, when we're getting into an owner financed situation, we want the person to stay in that house, in my opinion. I want the freedom and freedom comes from doing work once and being paid a lot of times from it not doing work once and being paid once from it, right? That's how you can tell if you've got a job or an investment. If you do one piece of work and it keeps paying you for years and years and years, that's an investment. Uh, and so that's what we want. I don't want them to refinance. The other option that uh, people might use in different states other than Texas is that you do have the ability to do contract for deeds and that becomes super common in those states. And I used to I actually kind of have to transfer my opinion on this. I used to say, hey, man, if we were in a state that could do contract for deed, absolutely. We're going to do contract for deed. It's easier to take back. But as I've gone national, I think we're in nine different states right now with houses. And as I've gone national, I'm in a lot of states that have the ability to do, um, uh, uh, you know, contract for deeds. And we don't do them. We wrap instead. Now, I shouldn't say we don't do them blanketly because I have done them. I do have uh, a contract for deed properties out in a few different states because there might be a situation that arises where that might make the most sense, whether that's for timing or the ability to easily subordinate a loan later or uh, you know whatever that might be. There's going to be some reasons that might... But there is like the court of equities and these things that do make those strategies a little bit riskier. And one of the funny things that we ran into is that, you know, we go into these states that, that allow contract for deed. And I'd always said, like I said, you know, hey, we're, we'll do contract for deed if that's what we'll come to find out. The only reason that contract for deed is super popular in those states is straight up that they just don't know how to do normal owner financing. The example that I use is months ago when the first contract for deed uh, state that we were in. We went through all this studying. I've talked to a lot of, you know, we've got some pretty high end attorneys on retainer for us, some national names uh, that are that are very, you know, hard to get in with. And and, uh, you know, I'm talking to them. I'm talking to some folks that I know have done 20 plus thousand contract for deeds and everybody's saying, you know what, dude, like contract for deed is not as great as everybody makes it sound. We would recommend you doing the owner financed route it's, instead. Just go ahead and transfer title, blah, blah, blah. That's what we started doing. So we're telling this agent who's bringing owner financed buyers to us. Hey, we're actually, we're not going to do contract for deed on this one or a land contract. We're going to, and by the way, just as an aside, land contract, contract for deed, lease option, lease to own, rent to own. Those are all varying forms of contract for deed. We're not going to go super into that because the, the differences are very minor. It's, it's, you're essentially saying the same thing on any of those.
those. They are my, there are differences, but it's, it's close enough. We're not going to talk about that today. But so we've got this guy marketing a house for us. And, uh, and that's where he makes his money is owner financed sales to people with a single family houses. We tell them, look, we want to actually transfer the title from day one. We're just going to do a wrap note on this uh, uh, instead of contract for deed which should be more enticing to your buyer as well, because they become the owner and then you've got a foreclosure process versus the what's called a cancellation of contract with a contract for deed, lease option, rent to own, whatever you want to call it. And the guy literally goes, oh, so you guys don't want to own or finance it? And it was the biggest like light bulb moment for me because I had had all these attorneys and all these super experienced national folks telling me, yeah, it's not all it's cracked up to be. It's just that that's the only thing that those guys know because it's the way that they've always done it. And the first thing that happens is this guy, when I tell him we want to do a wrap mortgage, literally says, oh, so you don't want to own or finance it. And that's how he makes his money. So be very careful if you're in a state that does contract for deed. It's not the bright shining moment that you may think it is. And I would recommend suggest or I would suggest looking at doing wraparound uh, 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 sales instead of contract for deed. But we'll talk about that either today if we have time or in a future subject when we get in more of the disposition side. Today, it's going to be focused more on the acquisition side because that's going to be more applicable to people uh, coming in here. The next thing to point out is that subject two is an acquisition model. OK. And what I've put here, I believe wholeheartedly, if you sell with sub two, you're going to leave a lot of money on the table. Similarly, if you buy with uh, a wrap, you're going to leave a lot of money on the table. You should always acquire with sub two and sell with a wraparound mortgage. Okay. That's a huge bit of knowledge to understand. Now I'm going to, I'm going to explain one thing and then Daniel, I want to kind of pass it over to you so that you can, you can uh, uh, help me out in making sure that I'm, I'm getting the proper point across. But one thing to really understand about how uh, seller financing is set up, you know, again, just to understand what's going on and guys, this is interactive. So please drop comments. Uh, Ika is looking on the streams and she's going to put those comments in here because we want to interact. If this is a topic that's important to you, please let us know what questions you have. If I'm going too fast or too slow, chime in because we need to make you uh, uh, the, the spotlight here. You guys are the ones that need to get where, you know, where it's going. So let us know, right? We want to know. So owner financing is like this wonderful umbrella term, okay? This may look like a jellyfish, but I'm going to make it, it's our umbrella. Okay, the phrase owner financing is going to be synonymous with seller finance. So I don't know if that even in and of itself clears some things up for people, but owner finance and seller finance, those are the same things, okay? They're synonymous terms, but they're umbrella terms that describe multiple other strategies. So underneath that, you have subject to, which is a form of owner financing. Underneath that, you have wraparounds, which is a form of owner financing. You've got free and clear, right? Where you can owner finance from a property uh, that has no debt on it and have your seller carry things back. You have uh, a second, uh, second seller carries right? Where there's kind of a mixture of, there's all these different strategies within this one umbrella term. And again, it's kind of like saying, Hey, I'm a real estate investor. I'm a wholesaler. Hey, I'm a, I'm a real estate investor. I'm a landlord, right? Real estate investors, the umbrella term. And you've got these little ma minor things inside of it. I want to be very, very strict on this. Do not buy a house with a wrap and do not sell a house subject to does that make sense, Daniel? Do you have anything you want to chime in on that? No, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, I've I've been studying with you for close to six years, so I've heard that enough times to not even, not even blink when I hear it anymore. Right. You don't even have to think twice about it, right? So, uh, and, and I appreciate you guys are uh, um, uh, putting in some questions. We got a couple in, like Matt from, from Florida says, is Florida one of those states that you do contract for deed in? Well, again, it's not a state-specific thing, right? It is a strategy specific thing. I don't necessarily uh, uh, you know, care about the state itself. What I care about is the strategy and the property. One of the things that I will always say about real estate, and this is one of the big reasons why I want you guys to get good at a lot of different strategies is I want you to have your property tell you the best way to make money. I don't want you to go in there necessarily 
saying, hey, this is the thing I need to do with every house. And if it doesn't fit that box, I can't do it. That is where a lot of wholesalers are going to die in this next market. Because if you don't have the ability to buy in every cycle, uh, then you don't have the ability to survive, right? If you're cycle dependent, that's a big deal. One of my creative executives joined in uh, probably three weeks ago. His name's Gabe Rodarte. He's a, he's a really sharp dude. I like him a lot, highly ethical um, from the three weeks that I've known him so far. But it seems, seems like a really straight up, straight up guy. Runs a, a, one of the larger meetup groups down in Houston area. And, uh, and I really liked while, you know, when we were talking about what freedom meant to him, his definition of freedom was being able to make money in any cycle. And I love that definition. You know, I think that's a great way to look at it. Daniel, what's your what's your definition of uh, freedom? Do you have a definition? For me personally, I mean, it's yeah. just the simple fact of freedom of health, like being able to buy the food I want and eat how I want, the freedom of physical mm. fitness, being able to go to the gym and do what I want to do on a physical side, the freedom of choice, being able to decide whether or not I go to work, what, when I work, how I work, the freedom of all of the things that are important to me in life, not really having someone that stands in the way between the decisions I want to make and the decisions that that are, are being required of me. So being able to have the ultimate you know, say-so and freedom as to the decisions I make on a daily basis. All of that being uh -huh. said, man, like uh, we've got the ultimate guide to owner financing live going on here. We're on slide one, and I know this is a solid class. Um, what's yes? What what are we coming up to, man? So let me ask you this: What makes a deal a deal? And I want people to chime in on this. I want people to answer this question: What makes a deal a deal? Okay, this is going to be the crux of what kills people in the next cycle or, or helps you to survive in the next cycle. Like if you could be on top of copying all these comments over, I really wanna see people's answers to this. What makes a deal a deal? Daniel, I'd like, your, I'd like your input on that. Daniel, what makes a deal a deal? That right there should really be determined by you as an individual. I can't tell you what your deal is or what my deal is. And that's one of the benefits about real estate is that we all have our own strategies. Some people might say, as long as it makes money, then it's a deal. Well, I have plenty of people that would argue with you that they want to lose money on that deal. And for those that don't even understand that statement, there are specific investing strategies that very high net worth individuals employ for tax benefits. And their goal is to lose money on the real estate. So you need to understand what your buy box is, what your in entrance and exit strategies are going to be, and what your defined goal is. For me, on a subject to deal, the, the cash flow would have to be pretty steep. I don't like the management aspects of subject to. So for me to take oh. one on, on and do a long-term sub two wrap, the deal would have to be pretty fat. I'm not going to do a sub two wrap for $200 a month in, in cash flow, but there are other people that would gladly do a sub two wrap for 200 bucks a month. But for me to do a yep. sub two wrap, I'm looking for at least four or 500 bucks a month to put myself in the middle of it. I love that you defined that out so clearly because there is so much of an element of you've got to decide what you want your portfolio to look like and you've got to shoot for that. It doesn't matter what Grant Kemp on Propelio is telling you. It doesn't matter what Creative Cash Flow tells you. It matters what you need. And I'll tell you right now, I took down deals in my first year that I wouldn't take down now. I think you should have a minimum cash flow requirement, right? My minimum cash flow requirement is 150 bucks. Uh, we've got everything kind of down to a machine. I'm cool with taking a deal on for 150 bucks a month but it better give me something, right? So where are you gonna make money in an owner financed deal? First of all, let's talk about this. Where are you gonna make money in a wholesale deal? Daniel, where, how, when do you get paid? Is that today money or tomorrow money? So wholesaling is definitely a today money and it's, it's, it's not everyday money. You know, you're not, you're not making a paycheck every single day. So you're out there hustling and grinding and your goal is to yep. get that property to the closing. But as soon as you close, you get that check, time to start over again. Absolutely. You're, you're unemployed the day after closing, as my uh, ops manager likes to say it, J uh, uh, John Garms. I, I love the guy. Um, where do you get paid on like a rental? Where's your money come from on a rental? Is that today money or tomorrow money? How does that get you paid? I consider rentals tomorrow money because I don't really consider most rentals to be cash flow. Most rentals I consider to be escrow for repairs unless you really have a really well-defined buyer box. But with rentals, really most of your income that's coming in monthly is escrow for future repairs. Your your money on that is future money. Your principal pay down of the mortgage if you hold it for a full 30 years and or your resale of equity capture in the future. But I don't really consider rentals to be a great cash flow opportunity. That's me personally. I agree. Go ahead. That, that's just me personally. Like if I want cash yeah. flow, I'm not going to. No, I agree. Rentals. I think it's a, I think that's insightful, right? Because, uh, and I really love, if you guys haven't watched the, uh, uh, the series on, on the market cycles, 
go watch that because Daniel drops a huge bomb in one of the earlier times that I freaking love how you define rentals as a seven year flip, right? That you're flipping a property and you're just kind of having everything escrowed and taken care of for you until the values get so high that you can flip that out. Or if you want to keep it long term, we've got some great answers here for what makes a deal a deal. Nicole Garner says a good ARV, a cheap purchase price. Mike L says if you make money, uh, uh, sombra, uh, sombra bish means or says cash flow or equity. Um, you know, this is, and then Santiago Luna, the, the winner here of the I've seen Grant's videos, gets the, uh, the point that I was looking for, a willing seller, right? Here's the thing that you can do with seller financing that you cannot do with other strategies. Seller financing is what allows you to take down a deal when you have a willing seller, kind of regardless of what their situation is. Now, that's not to be so overblown to say that we're not going to turn deals away because here's what most wholesalers get wrong that come to me trying to wholesale me a creative. How many, Daniel, how many times have you had somebody try to wholesale you a creative finance deal and their definition of a good sub two deal is it's a crap cash deal, right? Like that's the only, <laughs> that's the only definer. Well, this is a crap cash deal. Must be good sub two, right? right. You have that ever happen? I've had, that's I've had not plenty the truth. of people push, but it's not, it's not, it's not a good thing. Right. So with sub two, we are able to buy houses at the highest LTVs. We are able to buy stuff that you can't do with cash and you're going to be able to turn around and flip it to where you get a down payment of 10% when you're selling it with a wrap, which is going to most of the time be very comparable to the wholesale fee that you may have received from that property. We actually, so I have 24 properties right now in my inventory that we've contracted in the last two weeks and we're, and we're, we're marketing out in some sort of uh, way or fashion. Three of them, literally today, we decided, you know what, we could wholesale this and make 28 or we're going to net like 17 from a down payment if we hold it long term and we've got a $500 cash flow on this. Like there's stuff like that that's going to pop up where you get to choose which one you want. Now with owner financing, we get to capitalize in all of the profit centers with today money and tomorrow money and cash flow. Okay, so the reason why Daniel was saying, and I think wisely, that he can't count on a rental as a cash flowing property is because you've got to deal with CapExes. What's a CapEx, Daniel? Capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are costs and repairs required to the property. Anything that you're having to outlay onto the property for repairs is essentially considered capital expenditures, such as vacancies when you have to go through and do make readies on tenants and stuff like that. Those are your CapEx exactly. expenses, replacing a roof, replacing an air conditioner, hot water heater. Those are your CapEx expenses. And typically with a rental, if you're only cash flowing 300 bucks a month on it, then you're, you're likely just escrowing for repairs. Now, if you start talking about commercial property and larger property, that's where I'd look for cash cash flow and or notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because commercial property le uh, leases are much more similar to an owner finance lease because a commercial property like with a triple net is much more similar to an owner financed sale. The thing about owner financing is you are going to be able to actually count on your cash flow because you don't pay for those things. Let me ask you this. Everybody that's watching this video right now, if you have a mortgage, when was the last time you called your mortgage company and told them that your toilet was leaking? When was the last time you expected your mortgage company to fix the leaky roof from a hail damage, right? Who fixes that? You fix that. So why have we fooled ourselves into thinking that the only players get, that get to play the, uh, the mortgage game are Wells Fargo and Bank of America? Guys, you can do that too. The Wells Fargo's of the world get paid every first, and if they don't get paid, they foreclose and they get the asset back and they sell it again. So your cash flow in an owner-financed property, your gross income is your net income. If you have a $250 cash flow on a, you know, like I said, my minimum is 150. I would never do a rental for 150. Holy cow, I'd be losing so much money. But on an owner finance deal, if I'm grossing 150, I'm netting 150 a month, right? So there's your cash flow. Your today money comes from the down payment because you're going to get a down payment of 10%. Do not accept less than 10% on your sale. When you're dispositioning a house, do not accept less than 10%. You will be very tempted to because people are gonna offer you 5% or 6% and you're gonna say, man, that's a lot of money. I'd like to get this thing moved, so I'm gonna do it. The number one indicator of if your buyer is going to default on you is whether or not they put on a 10% down payment. It's not what their credit score is. It's not whether or not they've been divorced. It's not what their, you know, whatever, their, their criminal record looks like. It is whether or not they put down 10%. So always get 10% down payment. Well, oftentimes you're getting 80% of what you would have netted from a wholesale anyway. So you've got cash up front, you've got true cash flow, and the difference in what your note is owed to you and the note that you owe to a bank is your net worth. 
which grows over time. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago too, if you wanted to see the math behind that. So a willing seller means that you should be able to have a creative solution that's going to come up with a way for you to make money and to help your seller out of a hard situation because all these other wholesalers that weren't smart enough to watch Grant teach me something 11 a.m. are unable to make an offer that works for them. So let's dive in. I wanna answer a couple of questions here and then we're gonna dive into what are the big benefits and why do those benefits exist with subject to and owner financing so that you can be looking for them in your leads that are popping up for you. Um, Matthew Green pops up a question. He says, seller debt is first position. Second is a wrap of equity to the seller. When I sell on a wrap, where is that positioned? That's a good question. Let me draw that out for you because, I, you know, again, this is the chance, guys. If you've got questions, now is the time to ask these questions and get them answered. Here's how I'm going to draw this out. You have a house that you want to buy, okay? And I am a beautiful artist. So here's your house and it is owned by Joe homeowner. <clears throat> you are going to buy this house. Now, which one am I doing here, Daniel? Am I going to draw you like this or am I going to draw you like this? Does that make any sense? Is that too abstract? It does not make sense Am I drawing you as a person or you as a, as a, uh, uh, a box? I have no clue, but I'm, I'm that was a pretty this. abstract question. I wouldn't expect you to answer that right, but here's, here's the clue. Am I drawing you meaning, you know, Santiago Luna? Or am I drawing you meaning Santiago Luna's LLC that wants to buy this house? It's the LLC Santiago Luna's the LLC, right? I never want you to sign personally on anything going on here. I know Daniel and I have slightly differing views on when to create your LLC and all that kind of stuff because it can be a waste of your time. But when you're doing sell a seller financing, there's a lot of gears turning here. Undoubtedly, this is a more complicated strategy than wholesaling or flipping or any of those kinds of things. There are a ton more gears and there are a ton more places to slip up and you want to do things ethically and you want to do things correctly. And part of doing good business is always risk mitigation and having your own definition of what your risk mitigation needs to be. For instance, Daniel said he's not going to put up the risk that he feels a, a sub two deal uh, comes with with time management. Uh, unless it has a $400, $500 cash flow. Here's one thing that I think should be a baseline for everybody. Do not do anything outside of an LLC. When you sign that contract, you're signing it as Santiago Luna, comma, member. Don't even sign it with just your name. You are signing as a member manager of your LLC for protection. Limited liability corporation, or I'm sorry, limited liability company. So you're going to sub to that deal. Okay. And we're actually going to go into this here in just a second. It's going to make a lot more sense for you. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> which means that there's this bank up here, right? That, uh, uh, that, that, you know, Joe homeowner owes money to. It means that every month, instead of Joe paying that bank, you're going to pay that bank. That's sub two. Okay. Now your question was, where are you sitting with the wrap? Well, now that you've got this portion, this is a transaction in and of itself. You have acquired the property subject to their underlying lien. The house becomes yours. It goes to the entity and you continue to pay the bank on their behalf. From that point, you own the house and you have debt to this bank. Now it's not your name on the bank, but you have agreed to pay that debt. From that point, it's yours to do whatever you want. You can flip it, you can rent it, you can own or finance it, you can do anything, you can live in it. The house I live in is bought subject to, right? You can do anything you want, it's your house. You just had your financing taken care of for you. From there though, the strategy that I'm going to talk about because of just, you know, time is we want to do a wrap around mortgage to uh, Jeff and Betty, their family who doesn't have the chance to buy a house for whatever other reason, they're going to do a wrap around mortgage. So what's going to happen here is you've got a first lien, which is between Joe seller and his bank. You're technically going to have a second lien between you and Joe which says if you don't pay like you said you were going to, Joe gets to foreclose on you. That's the right thing to do. And then technically this wraparound mortgage in this situation is a third lien. But I'm going to give you some more graphics on that here in just a second. But that's a really good uh, question. I hope that that helps you out uh, with the answer. Let's pop over in uh, looking at what is the, uh, um, oh, and Jay has a really good question. Can you role play on how to convince the owner to deed a property to you? Uh, do you remember, Daniel, how long ago was that that we did the live call? That was like three or four weeks ago, right? 
So we yeah we did a live call probably about three weeks ago where you broke down a call that you had with the seller where you took the seller from a from a basically a cold call it was a referral but you took that referral from you know never hearing from you before to agreeing to sign on the on the dotted line and you broke that entire call I actually down about three weeks ago. I actually noticed. So what you want to do is go to Propelio's YouTube, look at Grant Teach Me Something's playlist, look for the live call breakdown. I actually realized yesterday, uh, I still have the website up. If you go to creativecashflow.com slash GTMS, uh, you can watch that video of the call where I've got a scroller at the bottom telling you all the techniques that we're using and that kind of stuff. That's going to really help you out there. So let's pop in over here and look at what are the benefits of doing a owner financed deal that outperforms a, uh, uh, any of the other strategies. Okay, well, what's one of the huge benefits of owner financing? We get to do high LTVs, okay? So what I mean by this is that when you're doing this owner financed deal, let me ask you this. Why is it <clears throat> that traditional knowledge tells us that we need to buy houses at 70 cents or below, or maybe 75 cents, or, or if you're in a super hot market, people have gone up to 80 and 82. What is that number representative of, Daniel? That right there is the gap that you really need uh, for the traditional fix and flipper to come in and acquire this property safely. So when you're talking about 70% loan to value, that leaves 30% of the equity out there. But most people don't realize that when you're acquiring a property with third party financing, such as a hard money loan, and you're intending on flipping it, anywhere between the low side of 13% to 18% of that of that house's value is going to go towards holding costs, loans, acquisition and disposition costs. So you're really normally netting somewhere between 12 to, to 18% on that house whenever you buy it. So that 30% gap of equity is where your where your profit comes in as well as your expenses. Yeah, here's something that I want everybody to be keenly aware of. Anytime you run into a number, a percentage in finance or in real estate, it is always a reflection of risk. Okay? Every percentage in real estate is a reflection of risk, okay? What I mean by that is that we've had enough smart investors come before us that said, if I'm going to lay cash out on a deal, I wanna be in at 70% because my worst case scenario should ideally be that I break even on this deal. Even if things go bad and I tear a wall down and there's termite damage and it costs $10,000 more, hopefully our worst case scenario is that I break even on this deal, okay? Um, it's a percentage of risk. Why might Daniel get a better interest rate from a bank than I might? Well, maybe the bank thinks that Daniel is a lower risk than I am. So they're going to get a better, every percentage in real estate is a risk. So the reason why we're buying at 70 and 75 cents on the dollar, exactly like what Daniel said is that we are, well, that's what we view as safe. We're going to get our cash back, but with subject to how much money do you actually have to come to the table for? Right? How much money is actually coming out of your back pocket to buy a house in sub two, Daniel? Really depends upon your exit strategy and what, what type of properties you're targeting on your acquisition. But you're typically looking around somewhere around eight to ten thousand dollars out of pocket to get into one. But if you have a back end buyer with a down payment, your net in the deal ends up typically being zero. So depending upon yep. what your acquisition disposition strategy is, you can get into these deals for limited to nothing out of pocket. So your risk in these is minimal, but your long term uh, obligation to these deals are extremely high. Yep, absolutely. So what he's talking about there is you may run into a seller, a lot of sellers coming up in this next market, especially in this next 18 months to five years, uh, maybe seven, we'll see how long it, it lasts. You're gonna have a lot of pre foreclosure leads, right? And so in that, it's gonna be people that are six to nine months behind uh, because of long story short, Dodd-Frank and a lot of the other just requirements of, of foreclosure, people can't get basically to the foreclosures block the auction house until six months after their first non-payment, right? So you're looking at a lot of six months behind, which if you're in a price range that I like, which is the $100,000 to $150,000 price range, that's where I really enjoy being for uh, sub twos and wraparounds, you're looking at $8,000 behind, $12,000 behind. But if you're getting a down payment of $15,000 or $20,000, you might be able to break even up front. And that's actually a huge plus. If you're breaking even up front or you're getting cash up front uh, as a net, that's a huge plus. What that means is you don't have any of your cash out of your bank account in on this deal by the time you close it and wrap it. And we kind of wholesale our owner financed deals a lot of times on the particularly thin deals. We're going to do a 90 day option period and we're going to market for a buyer. And we're not even going to acquire that house 
before we already have a buyer lined up for it. We're going to only own each of these properties for maybe an hour and a half because we acquire it, we close on it in the morning, and then we sell it as a wrap in the afternoon, right? So you're protecting yourself. You're using these funds. Your funds may only be out on the line for an hour and a half. You're getting reimbursed and you don't have any cash in there. If you don't have any cash on the table, why do you need to buy at a lower LTV? You're not risking any cash. So you're able to, with sub two, buy these houses that people have only owned for a year or two that do not have equity in the property. You know, again, when we look at what this market is going to be doing, we look at market cycles. We understand that a market cycle goes something like this, right? Well, where we are right now is right here, most likely. And as time keeps going, people's property values are going to be dropping so that somebody that wants to sell their house right here may have bought it right here. So they've seen an up and down and they just don't have equity in their house anymore. And a cash buyer can't compete with that, but you can because you're not putting cash out on the line. This is why one of the huge reasons why sub two is so good is the high LTVs. Another huge reason why it's so good is that your financing is built in unlimited, non-institutionalized, non-recourse lending. What does non-recourse mean, Daniel? Non-recourse meaning that your personal name and or LLC are on the line in the event that that loan goes upside down. While we absolutely as investors never desire for that loan to go bad, but in the worst case scenario, let's say something extremely wrong goes on, there, your personal name is not on the line for that loan. Exactly. Non-recourse means that in the worst case scenario, which we will always avoid, and I'll be very clear, I've never been foreclosed on, okay? We want to do everything in our power, even to the degree of if something happens where a loan gets knocked out, I'm going to encourage you, even if the loan does not legally require you to uh, uh, pay it anymore because of you know some sort of legal uh, uh, mumbo whatever, make sure that that person is taken care of, especially if it's a private lender, right? them out of your own personal pocket, out of other deals. Make sure that everyone is always paid. Uh, it's, it's, it's just the right thing to do, right? So non-recourse means that, hey, when you're buying sub two, remember that picture that I showed you a second ago? Check this out. This is in your LLC's name. Your LLC is not you. So that means that if things do go badly and there is a foreclosure, it's not showing up on your record, it's not taking your house. It's not taking your car. That's a huge reason why this is so beneficial. Another big reason uh, that sub two and owner financing is going to be so good for you is again. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is just kind of a part of it. We've talked about this. Sub two is an acquisition model. I can't. I can't harp that enough. People come to me a lot of times getting that mixed up. I really want you to get that in uh, as an understanding. It's fast and cheap, as my ex girlfriend is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so closing through an attorney's office is a big benefit of what you're able to do uh, with owner financing and creative and, and creative deals. Here's the thing is that the last time that we hit a huge market where creative financing was a huge deal for us, one of the issues that we were running into is that title was backed up. It was taking 14 to 21 days to get title policies approved because the market had blown up so much that title companies were just behind, right? So if you get a call, which us marketers comment today or comment right now, if you've ever gotten a call or shoot a like or whatever, if you've ever gotten a call the week before foreclosure with somebody being like, please save me out of this, right? If your title company's three weeks back, you just can't technically buy that house. But I know Daniel for a fact, I've seen him do it. Walked in on a Tuesday morning of the auction and wired money over and pulled a property out by buying it with seller financing and then turn around. I think you flipped the, the that, deal that I'm thinking of. I'm going to spend I'm going to spend 52 seconds on that because that was a wild deal. I got a phone call on Thursday before auction. All properties in Texas go to auction on Tuesdays, first Tuesday of the month. I get a phone call on Thursday, basically two business days before auction, and the seller has a decent deal, but the, the to make the deal work it needs to be subject to, but it was an inherited property so I couldn't talk to the bank because of whatever reasons. I'm not going to get onto all of those details, but I knew that there was an estimated 
$12,000 in past due payments. I'm doing everything I can to get this property cleared before Tuesday morning, and I absolutely can't do it. So I blindly, blindly, blindly wire $12,000 over to the bank the morning of the auction to get the sale stopped. And I take the property over subject to that morning. So I essentially bought that house in less than pretty much two business days. And uh, it was a yeah. risky transaction, but I, I ended up pulling about $18,000 out of it. So it was worth it. Yep. And that's one of those risk mitigation factors. You decide for your portfolio what your risk tolerance is, right? And so Daniel saw, look, I've got two options here. Either I lose 12 grand or I make 18,000 bucks. And he said, that's a deal I'm, I'm willing to do, right? He had a lot of cash. He was, he's, a, he's been a, a cash a wholesaler, right? So you should be putting cash away. You should not have a low bank account. I've been the guy. I'm, I'm, you're preaching to the choir, dude. I've, I'm like, dude, I make so much cash flow. Why would I have money in my bank account? Like, I'm just going to get more cash next month, right? Uh, that's not how we are anymore. You've got to have some, some uh, you know, we want to be able to survive a 50% default rate of our portfolio for nine months. That, which means that we've got, you know, half of our portfolio paying, half of it is not. And we've got enough cash reserves that whatever is not made up for in the performing 50% cash flow, we can make up with our own cash out of our cash reserves and survive for nine months uh, uh, of non-payments. We want a 30% uh, default rate to be able to survive indefinitely, meaning that 70% of our, of our property's performance uh, through their cash flow and is able, or their cash flow is enough to cover 30% of our portfolio's debt. Does that make sense? It's kind of complicated, but that's, it's a good idea to be, and Daniel harps on this a lot, and I really respect that about it. I'm glad that he asks me to bring this up too, because I kind of take that for granted, but a lot of people don't, right? You've got to, when you're looking somebody in the eye saying, I'm going to continue making these payments on your behalf, you have to play it smart. You have to be able to have enough money put away to cover those loan payments for six to eight months for that house. Uh, if your buyer's not paying you. Don't put yourself into an awkward situation where you can't cover the payments unless your buyer is paying. Don't do that. Be smart about it, okay? Uh, Angel, I'm glad you appreciated my sound effects. And then, uh, So yeah, so th that's, a, that's a big part of this. So yeah, Daniel had the risk tolerance to go for that, but because of owner financing, he was able to, as a wholesaler who was wise enough to learn about seller financing, go in and make money on a deal. He made 18,000 bucks in two days uh, because seller financing allowed him to do that. And then lastly, like I said, you can even buy your own homestead property uh, uh, with subject to. The house I live in, I bought subject to. It was a foreclosure lead. It was way above the price range that I typically work in. It came in as a JV lead. I threw it away, literally. I was like, ah, I don't work in house, uh, houses priced that high. And then I kind of looked at it, the pictures that got sent to me. And I was like, well, wait, wait a minute. That's actually a pretty nice house. What was the payment? <laughs> so, so we bought it and moved in, right? Like there's so many options if you know how to do this. And now is the time for you to be very familiar with these things so that you can get them done in the future. Let's talk about one thing that's going to be very important for you to understand in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, upcoming market, commercial versus consumer. OK, when I'm talking commercial versus consumer, what I'm meaning is I'm talking about commercial transactions versus consumer transactions with legalities. I'm not meaning a, uh, uh, you know, corporate building versus a single family house. I'm meaning corporate or I'm sorry, commercial transactions. So what that what that pulls out to is a commercial transaction is when you're buying something for an investment. OK, so your acquisition is a commercial transaction. Consumer transactions are defined by buying as a resident, something that you're going to uh, uh, live in. This is where all the stuff like Dodd-Frank takes into play. You know, con uh, 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 the uh, co uh, consumer law is Dodd-Frank. Um, consumer law does not apply to commercial transactions. And that's one of the things that you need to understand is that commercial law allows you to do basically anything. And this is a huge thing for you to understand because we've done some wacky stuff to take deals down, right? Wacky uh, uh, terms, wacky this, wacky that, stuff that a, that a consumer would never be able to, or you would never be able to do legally with a consumer. But the law, I think rightfully so, says, hey, look, you know, uh, uh, you know Santiago's name is still up here. I'm going to answer your question here in a little bit, Santiago. I've got that up in front of me. But, you know, Santiago or Matt or whoever, you guys aren't, you don't need this house to, 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 to feed and house your family. Therefore, we're going to let you kind of do what you want to do. It's kind of like the being an accredited investor 
thing where they kind of open up some of the uh, uh, um, uh, the laws to allow you some 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 differences that consumers cannot do and that's what allows us to get into properties crazy but then when we get out of the property i.e when we are selling it with owner financing excuse me my I'm, my studio lighting is burning me up so i'm turning my air conditioner down up here um when we get into uh the consumer sale the wraparound that's when you've got to be acutely aware of things like dodd frank and matt from florida matt, from Florida has a question, which is, I have a very important question that I can't get answers to. When you have a sub two deal, how can you market that deal to an end home buyer without having problems with TILA? Okay. TILA stands for Truth and Lending Act. It is one of the many things that Dodd-Frank amended. Dodd-Frank was the, the, the legal kind of knee jerk reaction to the financial crisis. I actually don't disagree for a moment uh, with anything that's in Dodd-Frank. I think Dodd-Frank actually did a great service for the industry. And I think that people that disagree with that don't understand Dodd-Frank. I literally have read Dodd-Frank from start to finish, every word. It's a huge act. I don't even think that Chris Dodd or Barney Frank read Dodd-Frank, but I have. I think that it's important. My definition of risk tolerance is I don't want to take information from somebody else. Scott Horn is a super wise dude. He brought me up in this industry. He's why I am where I am today. He took me under my wing, under his wing, showed me the ropes. Um, you know, one of the things that he always used to harp on is trust, but verify, right? So we, you can trust me, but I would prefer for you to go out and read these laws on your own, which thankfully it looks like Matt has, which is cool. Truth in lending talks about something called triggering terms. And that's the real key fact of what you need to understand when you're marketing for a buyer. Okay. So here's a difference between consumer and commercial law, commercial law. Like I said, it's the wild west. Like you do what you want, do what you want. Um, com uh, consumer law. If you're going to market a property, basically stay away from all numbers other than the sales price. Okay. Um, you can state the sales price. That's okay. I think a good thing for this, you in, for this guy to do, and, and I don't want to interrupt on that, is if you are looking at Tilla and there's a lot of documented blog articles and articles out there, like just Google Tilla Reg Z because all of the triggering terms are following under Reg Z. Google Tilla Reg Z triggering terms, and you should probably have at least a 45-minute sit-down and learn everything there is about it. Like Grant's about to go out there and knock out what some of those triggering terms are, but you should really commit that to memory and go out there and sit down and read up on all of the Tilla Reg Z triggering terms that are out there. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm actually going to do you guys – uh, a favor here, and Ike, I'm going to throw this in the uh, in the top of our of our. Uh, I'm going to throw this link at the top of our um, sheet. If you could throw that into the streams for everybody, I'm actually going to give you a straight uh, uh, portal to the actual laws. Now, the CFPB is the governing body that's in, in, in charge of Dodd Frank and all that kind of stuff. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Um, I got to hand it to them. A, uh, they have way too much power without any kind of checks and balances that is no if ands or buts about it i hate how it's set up because they just can do anything that they want and there's nobody that they got to report to i really dislike that but b the cfpb's website is actually an extremely helpful and very well done website to help you understand things if you go to the cfpb's website it's consumerfinance.gov uh, if you have any questions about stuff um it's lunchtime so you may hear my my child uh, be displeased with, with going downstairs. Um, but if you have any questions about things, go to consumerfinance.gov. And what you want to search for is the, uh, um, oh my gosh, what are they called? The small, um, small creditor. I'll look it up. I, I knew it before I got distracted on that, but they do entity, small entity, um, compliance guides, I think is what they're called. Uh, they actually put in plain English, they break down what the interpretations of the laws are. They, they quote where everything's coming from and they give you really good outlines of what's current and real and what you need to know as a small entity. They do a great job on that. The majority of that is built for consumers to read as they're wondering if they got screwed, but there is a whole kind of back end if you search into it as a lender that has these small entity compliance guides that are just phenomenally done. I just gave you a link to all the actual e-regulations. They've, they've worked really hard to put these things, but previously to like 2015, 16, it was really difficult to actually find the laws and read surprisingly enough you kind of had to have some connections to get to them now it's not the case and i really enjoy that now in truth and lending the thing that you need to be aware of when you're marketing a property and i see people make uh make this mistake a lot you can say the price of the sales uh, the sales price of the home 
you can here's what I, my suggestion is and just kind of keep it at this and and then go read the truth and lending uh, uh triggering terms and even on a regulations website you can do a search for triggering terms and it'll pop up for you showing you in reg z if you just say owner financed house for sale three beds two baths one hundred and nine thousand dollars uh you're good okay sales price that's it you can say low down payment you can say easy financing. These are comparative terms, okay? If you put anything that is a solid term in there, like $10,000 down payment, 10% down payment, 9.5% interest, $1,300 payment, any actual numbers or solid something that's not comparative, you then have to follow it up with all that, uh, like the APR, and it's not the end of the world, but you have to put that stuff in there. It's the reason why every time you hear a mortgage lending commercial, they give you, hey, we've got this mortgage lending, uh, 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 you know, things available for you, 3.95 APR, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end of the commercial, it's like, it's because they've done a triggering term and now they have to do all these disclosures behind it. That's why they do that. So uh, just use comparative terms. When we market it, it's only going to be a sales price, beds and baths. Call us for more information. That's what we're going to market it as. For me, the simplest all right? way so that's a really good question. Reg Z is like, if you mention anything about the terms at all, you have now triggered TILA and you're required to say all of it. Like you can't just say the down payment. You can't just say the interest. You can't just say the payment. You can't just say, uh, you know, any credit or what kind of credit score. Cause you have to say with approved financing with this, with approved credit, with approved blank, blank, blank. So just stay away from all of those things. And really yeah. the best option for that is to go out there and spend your hour studying and reading on it because it's very important to you. So TILA Reg Z is where to go, but we are getting into that hour long mark. So we do need yep. to start moving forward on that. Absolutely. Uh, let me answer another question here. When buying a house sub two, who's responsible to pay the taxes and insurance? That's another really good question. Again, this is the beauty of owner financing, right? All the, so many of the, the questions that we will inherently have that are logical questions to approach with owner financing. And I think that I can blanketly answer a lot of them here is that so many of the questions revolve around who's responsible for blank. Just think about it, right? When you own a house from a loan with Wells Fargo, who's responsible for it? So the owner of the property, the person on deed record is the person who's responsible for that loan or for, uh, uh, you know, the repairs for all that kind of stuff. Right. So we've got a few slides that I really want to get through. Um, but again, I think that that is a uh, uh, I think that that's a really good kind of indicator of just think about on a normal loan. All we're doing, all we're helping you do is sit in the seat of Wells Fargo. At the end of the day, just think of yourself as Wells Fargo and think of the responsibility that every other homeowner has and the relationship that they have together, that's owner financing. That's your disposition side. That's the responsibilities that you have and they have. So whoever owns the house is whoever pays for repairs, taxes, insurance, and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so let's dive into this because I think this is gonna be very helpful. I'm gonna talk about who's your seller and I wanna talk about the just a graphical illustration of what sub two looks like in slides that I think are gonna be very helpful for you. And that'll wrap us up for the day and we'll take some more questions again thank you guys for being here thank you guys for asking these questions they have been really good questions uh thank you to marino and dan and uh, abimbala uh we buy houses dallas you guys have all shared our live streams guys we can really you know we can we can use that we want you to share this out there because this is information that people need and uh you know i, I was interviewing for this uh, creative executive that's joining today um or, or you know most likely he said yes last night and was wanted to think about it but he's, he's probably coming in and he's a, a really good guy and um you know he was he was asking me he's like well you know because he's in houston i actually happen to have a bunch of for whatever reason a bunch of students come out of houston and he's like well do you think that there might be some saturation issues that you're training these people in in houston and i want you guys to think about this if i honestly felt like there were going to be saturation issues from other people knowing how to do this guys i'm gonna be a conceited jerk for a minute I'm one of five people in the nation that understands owner financing to this level. And that's very conceited of me, but I also think it's very pragmatic of me. I know enough people in the nation. Uh, I've been very fortunate. My superpower, everybody has superpowers. My superpower is that I get close friendships with people I have no business making eye contact with. So I know a lot of people in the There's just not a lot of people that know how to do this stuff well and right, right? If I felt like there was going to be a saturation issue, do you really think I would be training you how to do this? because this is what I'm doing. Wouldn't I want it all to myself? I'm national. 
So absolutely not. To say that we're competitors is like two fleas on the back of a St. Bernard arguing over whose dog it is. So share this information. You have the ability to help somebody else survive this next cycle. And that ability may not be being in front of the camera, but it might be sharing it and making sure that this group that you're in with wholesalers sees how to do another option that saves their rear. And then guess what? You're building a good community of support around you that's going to help you buy more houses in the future. Okay. So think about that. Um, all right. So let's look at who your seller is, because this is going to be one of the big questions I get. It's like, well, yeah, but who would ever sell to me like that? Sub two leads, first of all, are found in all the same lists you're already marketing to. And over 80% of my closed deals historically, that's a little bit different now that I've partnered up with Ronnie, who's such a marketing genius, but historically over 80% of my deals have come from investors uh, who could not do sub two because we do JV. If you want a JV with me on a lead, just to kind of learn the ropes and make sure you're making money and getting things right on your few, first few, it's how me and Daniel got to know each other. I, you know, he came to me for mentoring on, on, uh, on doing this stuff. That's how me and Daniel met each other. We JV'd, uh, go to creativecashflow.com slash JV with me. You can sp submit it there and my team will be right on it and we'll help you close that deal. Um, but the important thing that I'm taking away here is that over 80% of my deals got said no to by another, by another investor. So you want to be the person who can say yes. This is kind of like, have you ever looked at buying a car and you're like, man, I really like that car. And then over the next like month, you're like, holy crap, this car is everywhere. Right? Like you never saw it before, but all of a sudden, everywhere you look, you see one of those cars. Daniel, have you had that kind of situation happen? All the time. That is how owner finance leads are in your wholesale leads. You did, you had no clue that your leads that you've been getting have been full of owner financed opportunities. But as soon as you learn the ins and outs and the benefits of what you can and cannot do, they're everywhere. Right? So you don't have to look super specifically. They're already in the leads you're marketing to. One of the big ones that you're going to be running into is foreclosures. I say it's like f shooting fish in a barrel. Um, it's, it's going to get more like that over this next 18 months to, to five years than it has been over this last four or five years, because it's been super competitive in the foreclosure uh, closings and everybody's had equity. And so it's been kind of hard for this last four or five years, but it's going to get better and better uh, for us as equity uh, draws down low to no equity deals. We're going to be able to clean up after the cash buyers here. I'm going to give you guys a really good approach to getting a JV lead. Okay. Because you guys are the smart ones watching this video, learning how to do owner financing and going through the Propelio Academy. You know, if you go to propelio.com slash Academy, we've got an entire lesson on all the deep dives. I mean, it's like 36 videos. It's something like 19 hours worth of education I did on how to do this stuff. So you can really learn the ins and outs. You go to these, J these other people who have not learned how to do it. And you pitch them like this. You say, Hey, how often are you running into a deal where they say no, because you can't give them enough. Right. And uh, or they, because they owe too much. Right. And you're going to get ah, that happens. Right. Uh, some somewhere between. Yeah. I run into that and dude all the time. So then you're going to say, well, I actually specialize in those leads. That's actually like I do owner financing and those are the perfect leads for me. So next time you run into that, shoot that lead over to me. I will help close that deal for you. And when it closes, I'll pay you for the deal, pay you for the lead uh, as a percentage of whatever that deal makes. And here's the key factor. Here's the key pitch. That way you're paying for your marketing campaign out of your trash can. Okay. If you can be the guy or the girl that knows how to take care of these problems for other people, when you, you know, even on that call that we go over, uh, that we were mentioning from a few weeks ago, that lead was sent to me from another wholesaler that just didn't want to have to worry about getting into all the, the ifs and ands about uh, owner financing, but he was really attracted by, Hey, he's going to make 1500 to 5,000 bucks per closing and he doesn't have to do anything on it. And it's a deal he couldn't close anyway. Right? So that's going to be a great pitch for you. Uh, the other thing is going to be divorce leads when people are just kind of done with it. These can be a little bit trickier, but again, a lot of times these are folks who really need help to get out and to get out quickly and get out with a good option, especially if they have low to no equity and then vacant homes. I love the pitch of, Hey, your house is just sitting there costing you money, right? Why not let me stop the bleeding? You already have this loan sitting in your name anyway, right? It's just costing you money over there. So I can buy the house and cover that payment for you. It's still going to show up on your credit, but the payment's going to get paid and it's helping your credit grow and blah, 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 blah. That's another good way to get it. All right. So I'm going to hit this, uh, this, uh, um, uh, graphic on how sub two works that I think is really going to outline it for you guys from a technical perspective. In the meantime, I want you guys to be dropping questions. I want you guys to be liking this. I want you guys to be sharing this, uh, because again, we have a responsibility to help everybody in the market grow. I love Daniel. I don't, Daniel, did you, did you take this phrase from somebody or is this your phrase? Cause I attribute it to you all the time 
don't judge me by the millions I've made, judge me by the millionaires I've made. Is that yours or did you get that from someplace? Someone else may have said it, but I, I said it myself. So I don't really know that if anybody else has ever said it, but that's what I said. Right. That's totally a fair, like there's a lot of times that I think that I created something and then like I see it on a TV show and I'm like, oh, I guess I didn't say that. Uh, so yeah, but I always attribute, I love that phrase. It's super true. And you can do the same thing, right? You can help other people grow. All right. So ask the questions. We'll get through that at the end. Here's the graphic that I want to show you guys. All right. To understand truly what owner financing is, you first have to understand truly what the traditional bank financing model looks like. So traditionally, you're going to have a seller who wants to sell their house. They owe money to the underlying lien, which I'm putting as UL right here. You're going to have a buyer that pops into the picture and they're going to say, hey, man, I would love to buy your house. Sellers are like, cool, man, show me that you can buy that house. And so then the, uh, the, the buyer is going to go to their bank and they're going to say, hey, bank, <clears throat> I buyer, I'm going to try and illustrate this out for you. I buyer, I buyer, huh? that's funny. Uh, Want to buy this house over here. So would you lend me $110,000 to buy this house? Bankers like, okay, cool. Show me all your credit and all that kind of stuff. We'll give you a pre-approval. So they provide a pre-approval to the buyer. The buyer shows it to the seller. And so they get under contract. When they get under contract, they're going to take that contract to a title company. They're going to run title. They're going to make sure that everything's cleared up. And then what the title company is going to do is going to close that deal. Now, when they close that deal, there's going to be a warranty deed signed from the seller to the buyer. Okay. So if this was Matt, if this was Santiago, I can't remember who it was. Somebody had a question earlier about really trying to understand where your lien position is. This is going to help you. This is going to help you a lot with that. So the title company gets a warranty deed signed from the seller to the buyer. That's how they, that's how they transfer properties ownership. Well, at that point in time, the title company is also going to have the buyer sign off on a mortgage or a deed of trust and a note. Daniel, what's the note say? The note says the terms of the loan, including, you know, who gets paid, when they get paid, how long, how big are the payments, what are the terms of the loan? Absolutely. What's the deed of trust say? Deed of trust says what the terms of default are, who, who's, who's responsible for taking care of taxes, insurance, and what happens if they don't get them paid, who gets, you know, who gets foreclosed on and what the foreclosure process looks like. Yep, absolutely. So mortgage and deed of trust are basically the same thing. It depends on what state you're in. Some states use mortgages, some states use deed of trust, but they're essentially the same thing. Uh, the note says, hey, you owe $110,000 for the next 30 years at three and a half percent. The deed of trust says, if you don't pay that, we get to foreclose on you, right? So now we've got these three definitive uh, uh, pieces of information that define ownership on a property. So what happens is the banker is then going to wire the money to the title company. The title company wires whatever is owed to the underlying lien first, because liens get paid off before the seller does. And if there's any more money left over, the seller collects that money. And what we're left with is what you're going to run into. A homeowner that has a warranty deed to the house and a mortgage and a, and a note to a bank. Okay, three separate documents. So let me ask you this. What defines the ownership of that property? Which part of that defines the ownership? The deed. The warranty deed only. What part of it defines who's, who is responsible for the debt? The note. So the note and deed of trust are separate documents from the warranty deed. And this is a huge piece of information for people to start understanding how sub two works is because we've been under this understanding inherently kind of uh, uh, logically that whoever owns the house owes the debt. Okay. That's not true. Whoever owns the house, is the person who's on the warranty deed. Whoever owns the debt is the person that's on the, uh, is on the deed of trust or the, or, or, or the note. So they're separate documents and that's what we're going to be uh, uh, looking at. So that now I want to take that same situation, okay, where the seller, you know, has the underlying mortgage and you're trying to get the warranty deed and all that kind of stuff. And I want you guys to pay attention to how this shifts, okay? Now we're going to just shift this around a little bit. This is how sub two works, right? So we're actually getting the bank, oops, wrong button. Which one is it? This one. We're actually getting the bank for the buyer completely out of the situation. You see how the bank just kind of disappeared right over here like this. The, the buyer, i.e. you, do not need to go to a bank and get a loan. You are going to have the warranty deed signed to you from the seller, which gives you what is it, Daniel? Ownership of the, or the, the, the warranty deed, which gives you what? Warranty deed gives you the ownership of the property. 
And in return, what you're going to sign to the seller is called a deed of trust to secure performance. Okay. Now this is a great Scott Hornism. This is one of the tricks that you know, I say tricks, the, the, the techniques, the ways to do it uh, that I think that he kind of created. Uh, I got to give him a lot of credit because he really, he really uh, uh, um, pioneered a lot of what subject to is, especially in Texas and in the nation. And somebody that flew in from California tell me one time, he's like, dude, freaking Texas is like the, the Silicon Valley of owner financing, right? Because all of the biggest players are here. We've got us and Mitch Steven and Eddie Speed and Scott Horn, like we're all right here. Uh, and it's, it's kind of true, but Scott did a great job of kind of setting up a lot of these things. So we're going to sign a deed of trust to secure performance. What that says is uh, the normal deed of trust says, Hey, you've got a, I'm going to point to this, right? We've got a deed of trust and a note. So the normal deed of trust says, Hey, you got a note, you owe $110,000 over 30 years at three and a half percent. And the deed of trust says, if you don't pay what's in that note, then we get to foreclose on you. But the seller in a sub two situation is not lending you anything you are not borrowing from the seller, right? There's not a note here for, for a foreclosure to be attached to. What there is, is an agreement, agreement to perform. You are saying, if I buy your house, warranty, t warranty deed to me, I will continue to make your monthly payments on your behalf. Okay, that's where this triangle comes in. That's the phrase. We're never gonna say taking over on payments to a seller because it can imply that they don't have responsibilities anymore on this loan. And we don't want to wrongfully give them that, imp uh, that, that uh, uh, impression because they do. Their name is on the loan. So you are going to quote, make their payments on their behalf. Now on these videos and stuff like that, I may say taking over on payments because it's a bunch of investors talking to each other. But I wanna be very careful that when you're in a consumer situation, you're not giving them a uh, false understanding of what's going on. You are making them understand that this is going to be something where you are continuing to pay on their behalf. Now, we have left the mortgage in their name, just like before. They deeded the property to you, which gave you possession and ownership of that property through that warranty deed. In return, you are giving them back a deed of trust to secure performance, which says, hey, you didn't give me a loan, but I did agree to continue making these payments on your behalf. Therefore, if I do not perform as I said I would, you have the right to foreclose on me. Just like if I didn't do what was in a note, you would have the right to foreclose on me. If I don't perform, you have the right to foreclose on me. Okay. So now, do we have any questions on that before we move on? This is gonna, the, one more slide here that shows, that shows another way to think of that. If you have questions, pipe in with them now. I wanna uh, uh, make you look at this other illustration here. And I'm actually gonna back that up one slide. I want you to watch this illustration, okay? When we have this situation, this is how you bought this property sub two, but I also wanna illustrate to you the lien position, um, specifically for like what that question was earlier. Like where are the lien positions? Where does everything sit? So watch this illustration, how this moves over. I want you to understand that the mortgage, the deed of trust that's with Johnny Seller is a first lien because what defines lien position, Daniel? The date it was recorded, the date and time that it was recorded. Date and time it was recorded. That's it. Not price or anything like that. The second lien is going to be the lien that the seller is putting on the house with you to buy the house so that they have the right to foreclose on you, right? The only thing that matters in filing is the date and time in which it was filed. So from that point, you have now acquired the property subject to, you're going to continue making the monthly payments on their behalf, and you have the right to do anything you want to do with that property. You can sell the property with owner financing, you can rent it, you can do anything you want. The one risk that's being taken in all of this is going to be the due on sale clause, which we've done several classes on. Um, uh, you know, six weeks ago, we did a whole hour and a half on the due on sale clause. And will this be if you're in the upcoming season? I really don't personally think so. But you know, in the in the I've had direct correlation with over 10,000 deals. We've had fewer than 10 uh, of these called. I'm, I'm calling on the experience of guys that I know. I haven't done 10,000 deals, uh, but we do have a due on sale clause video to watch if you're more concerned with that. So I hope that that kind of illustrates out some of the big benefits of what subject two is going to do for me, some of the technicalities of how subject two is going to help, some of the separation between what is sub two versus a wraparound mortgage, some of the things about when you're uh, you know offering for sale. We've gone over a lot of topics today, right? And I hope that that was a really 
uh, 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 good situation for you. James Stanley says, I just finished all 36 sub two videos. What a great series. Propelio Academy is awesome. Again, if you haven't watched it, there's much more in the Propelio Academy. There are some ballers in there talking about stuff they would have never talked about. I love Christina Krause is in there talking about great marketing strategies. We got Eddie Speed in there. We got myself. We got some insurance experts, some multifamily uh, experts on there. So go to propelio.com slash academy if you want to watch that. Uh, let me see if we can pop through a couple of questions here. I think we've got two more that I haven't gotten to yet, which is what is your rebuttal when the seller objects to the 90 day option period? Um, that's all a talk off, right? That's the negotiations of it all. So you've got to decide is this, is the deal worth doing? Does it hit your risk tolerance or not? And then you decide whether or not you want to give them a, uh, a, a smaller, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Smaller option period, right? And then lastly, the other question that I've got on here, Santiago, is would you rather have control over the property once you acquire it and disposition it with a lease option, or would you just give ownership to an end buyer with owner financing? I've heard many different opinions. You know, that we actually addressed that a little bit at the beginning. So I encourage you to rewind, watch at the beginning because I address uh, uh, in, a, in a much more detailed story as to why we have this opinion on it. But I prefer to just give title to everybody. There is a scalability factor of having a, of just knowing, hey, this is the strategy that we're going to use. Uh, there is a simplicity factor and there's just a legality factor. You know, the guys, I, I'll put it this way. We are, you know, I work in DC. I work in Austin um, to, to affect the lending laws uh, that are going on. You know, we've got, you know, I've had lots of meetings with senators, lots of meetings with house reps and, and, and we were, you know, by golly, we were able to, to actually change the laws this last go around uh, in, in, in a way that was favorable to us because as much as these guys are trying, they just don't understand lending. They're not in the, in the REI world. And so it really helped having some representation there. That said, check out Texas100.org if you're in Texas. We need 100 people who think that uh, having their investing strategy protected is worth a thousand dollars a year to them because guys guess what lobbyists are expensive and none of the texas one i'm on the board with eddie speed mitch steven uh uh you know mike powell david finolio uh um um paulo dwyer right we work a lot to go out there we've spent a lot of money on airfare and buses and hotels and we do not take a single dime out of the membership fees that are paid there those membership fees go straight to lobbyists because lobbyists cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we've been reaching into our back pockets uh, uh, with tens of thousands of dollars each on top of all the other stuff to cover this stuff. So please, if you feel like this is something that you is, you're going to get value from, uh, it's time to re-up texas100.org or sellerfinancecoalition.org if you are in a national space, because we are working nationally and we are working stateside. Uh, so check those out. We would love to have your membership to help with that kind of stuff. That said, we've got our fingers in. We're, we're close to senators. We're, I mean, I'm, first name basis with, uh, oh, did you, did I lose you? No, I'm first name basis with the, like the commissioner of lending in Texas. We know that these senators understand the lease options and what's been done and what's happening on them. And, uh, and it's on their radar and they don't really like it too much. Right. And they're they're So we've got to, we've got to find our ways to do things the right way. My short answer is just do things with wraps when you can. Okay. Um, here's another question that comes in. Do you send money under your name or the lien holder's name for the bank or how would that work? That's a good question. Yeah, we just send the check from, from our account. Uh, I'm not worried about that. We send the check from our account. But, but more importantly, I would tell you time and time again, unless you can afford an in-house bookkeeper paying them uh, you know, whatever the equivalent of $75,000 a year is in your market, you know, we're in DFW, it would take about a $75,000 a year bookkeeper. Unless you can afford to have that in-house, do not try to self-service these loans. Use a servicer, okay? That's, that's very important. And then uh, I'll take this one last question. Uh, Grant, I've always wondered, and I'm sure you've covered it, but if a seller wants to go buy a new house and they aren't going to have, uh, and they, aren't they going to have to provide enough income for the new house, and the house they subject to to the investor. That's, a, that's another very good question. And we'll end with that question unless Daniel has something else that he wants to cover in there. Uh, you know, that is gonna be up to the underwriter entirely. The underwriter of the new loan is gonna determine how much the subject to loan is going to affect it. Now, what I will say is uh, it used to be that the sub two loan, the loan that they did to you from Wells Fargo was treated very similar to like how a rental would be. For the next year, the next 12 months, they would treat, a th or I'm sorry, 30%, a third of, uh, whatever the PITI payment was on the sub two loan, they would treat that as debt on the, uh, the seller. 
Okay, so let's put some names, right? Joe sells you a house and he owes Wells Fargo. He owes Wells Fargo $900 a month and you sub to it from him. Now, Joe wants to go buy a new house and he's going to buy it from, you know, financing from whatever, Bank of America. Bank of America would treat $300 of that Wells Fargo loan towards Joe's debt to income ratio. They would say, okay, we've seen that somebody else is paying this. We're going to count 30 or a third of this towards your DTI for a year. Once you've got a year of seasoning showing somebody else is paying that, then we won't count any of it. Uh, that's how it used to go until about 2014, 2015. I can't remember exactly when it switched, but then it switched. And now I'm having sellers ever since then who, and I know, you know, underwriters at Chase and, and things like that, who actually got you know, the, the underwriting guidelines handed down to them that now uh, they just don't count any of the sub two loan towards the debt to income ratio as long as there's proof that somebody else is paying it. I've had lenders or I've had uh, sellers go get a new loan uh, the same month or the next month of selling me a house sub two. The important thing is to talk to your seller and never guarantee something that you cannot personally fulfill. So do not guarantee that they can go get another loan without any, without any uh, uh, problems because you can't guarantee that. If you're not giving them a loan, you can't guarantee that. But what you can use is the beautiful word of historically speaking, which I use all the time. And I'll say like, hey, historically speaking, what I've seen is blank. And I'll just talk about what I just said. So historically speaking, I, Grant, have never had a seller who would have been able to get a loan without the sub two in their name, have any trouble getting a loan with the sub two in their name. Okay. So that's, that's kind of my take on that. Lots of information to go over today. Daniel, is there anything else that you want to uh, uh, pop in there? No, man, I really like the way that you've explained that. That's the way you've explained it for years. That's the way you taught me to explain it. And I like the historical piece because no one can ever and never should put themselves in a position where they're telling a seller that they definitely can go out and get another loan because there's no way that you can control that. That's not your your wheelhouse to control. So telling a seller, you know, historically speaking, what I've seen in the past is that the underwriting will look at the subject to loan as someone else's responsibility as they're making the payments on it. And as long as you're able to qualify for the loan without that, then you should be able to qualify for it with it. And I love how you've explained that. And that's how I've always explained it since you've taught me. And I've never really had a seller or object to it after I've explained it to him that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just we're just very careful to tell him. Look, I can't I can't guarantee something I can't guarantee. If I'm not going to personally do it, I can't guarantee it. But historically speaking, All right. let me answer seen. Craig Burns' as question we, real quick as we as we wrap yeah, this up. We're about an hour and twenty into this. He just asked, "How does the owner file foreclosure on you if you just agreed to make payments on their behalf?" Is, is that what you put in the contract? So, Greg, I don't know if you were able to see that, but Grant was talking about filing what was called a deed of trust to secure performance. That deed of trust to secure performance is filed publicly, and that is the terms of the agreement between the seller and, and you as the buyer saying that I agree to make this person's payments. And in the event you do not make this seller's payments, the seller has the, the rights guaranteed inside of that deed of trust to secure performance to go out there and foreclose on you if you are not making the payments like you promised. So that is the purpose of the deed of trust to secure performance. And if you didn't see that part of today's class, rewind it back with that deed of trust to secure performance is what secures secures your performance on making those payments on behalf of that seller. And if you do not do that, the seller has the right to foreclose on you. Now I have seen, and I think this is the types of things that will get you regulated out of this industry and get seller, seller financing stricken off of the uh, opportunity list for us is when you go out there and you start doing subject to deals where all you're doing is having the seller deed you their, 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 their property. Well, they have no recourse. They have no, they have no, uh, no, options for going out there and getting their home back in the case that you don't make the payments. You need to give the seller these protections. You need to give the seller these, these, this proper paperwork to make sure that you are performing. Do you have any feedback on that grant? Nope. That's absolutely, uh, you know, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. There's nothing legally that says that you have to do that, but there's everything operationally and ethically, in my opinion, that says you have to do that. It is only right to give this seller some sort of recourse for if you don't do what you said you were gonna do. It's only the right thing to do. So I believe heavily in, you know, like we've seen here, the deed of trust to secure performance is a lien position. I, I just sold three notes, they closed today, uh, um, or they're funding today, I should say. Uh, part of that is I had to get a release from one of my sellers because I had bought that house with sub two, right? And so I had a DTSP signed with them. 
So to, uh, they needed to release my lien. The other ones I had taken down with private money. But that's, uh, that's a very important part of, of doing these transactions, so in my here, opinion, is giving the seller recourse. Here's some of the things that I have seen personally as a real estate investor taking phone calls coming in. I'd have to say at least a half a dozen times. And this is extremely sad. A seller will call me up and say, hey, I sold my property to XYZ person. They said they were going to make the payments for me and they haven't made a single payment since I sold them the house. And I'm like, well, what kind of paperwork did you have put in place? And the absolute only thing that they put in place was they signed the deed to their house over to somebody else. And at that point in time, outside of extensive lawsuits and things like that, there is nothing that's really going to be able to happen. You've really given up all of the control. And if you are going out there and doing these types of things, or if you know of people that are out there doing these types of things or teaching these types of things, it is those types of things that will have this industry regulated beyond ability to perform. So if you don't want to see those regulations come in, make sure that you're giving these sellers the ability to foreclose on you if you're not performing or if you are knowing of other people that are doing this and not giving the seller the ability to foreclose on them and perform then we are doing our industry a disservice and we will see this get regulated beyond belief because what's going to happen whenever that whenever you i've got personally at least a half a dozen stories where a seller has called me up and said i can't do anything i've given my house away and i don't have anything to perform on well when enough of those people start complaining to their attorney general or to their to their regulate regulators we will be regulated. And, and, I, and I say deservedly so, because if we will allow our industry to run in that fashion, that is not acceptable. So we must do this properly and make sure that we are not taking advantage of these people. So with that being said, I'm going to land the plane. Grant, do you have any final thoughts? No, I don't. I think you covered it all. And I just want to cover that also that that's not a hypothetical fear. That is literally, I spent... Uh, weeks on end going down to Austin, Texas to talk to senators and commissioners and house reps to because they almost took away the sub two rep because there was one bad group out of Austin. Um, were they out of Austin? Yeah, they were out of Austin uh, that screwed some people over and did things the wrong way. Right. And so do things the right way because it takes one bad apple to regulate everybody out. And so we've got to do things ethically because it's right. And because it's, uh, uh, you know, we got to spread the word to make sure that everybody's doing things right. So I appreciate that you guys are here. I uh, appreciate all the kind comments, you know, James saying, I love the go-giver attitudes, uh, you know, love all the training from uh, Liana. She's halfway through the training in Propelio, so so much value in all caps. I love it. Uh, thanks, you guys, for the real deal from Philly Phil. I appreciate all of you guys being here. Again, share. Uh, like if you guys like the way that I teach and you want more interaction, more ability to do these Q and A's, I do a Q and A for all my students every Monday night and we're running during this time. I don't know how long it's going to last. We might pull the plug really at any minute. And I hate to put that kind of uh, uh, scarcity principle out there, but it's the truth. We just don't know how long we're going to do that. But the, uh, but right now we're doing 50% off. And if you put COVID 50, all caps or all lowercase uh, COVID 50, you'll get 50% off of the seller financing essentials which again, gets you a year worth of the Q and A's that you're able to get in, gets you a, a I've, I've, I've uh, uh, aggregated all of the videos we've ever done for anybody and put it out on there. And there's some exclusive videos as well as uh, the sub two contracts that you might need nationally are gonna be offered to all of our students too. So if you like how I teach, go check us out. COVID 50 is the, the discount code to get you 50% off seller financing essentials. Uh, creativecashflow.com slash memberships is where you would go from there. And if you guys have not checked out Propelio, especially since it's new, uh, launch and rebuild guys. It is slick. It is really cool. They've done a lot of really cool stuff. So you've got just really everything in one place for a super low price. You got your websites taken care of. You can actually get like an at your, your company name domain for your email. So you're not at freaking yahoo.com when you're giving a seller an email, it takes care of CRM. It takes care of skip tracing. It takes care of your marketing list. I mean, it's just it, the, the, your comps. I mean, it, the list goes on and on of the benefits that you have. And I think, isn't there even a trial that they, they do, or, or is that true? Yeah, we got a 14 day free trial, no credit card required. So if you're concerned about the risks of going in there and getting charged, we remove the credit card as a barrier to entry, show up with your email, full access to the program for 14 days. It is my belief that we provide so much value in this marketplace that once you see the product, you will certainly love it. And once you love it, you will gladly earn, I will gladly earn your business. So if you are a part of this or have not been a part of this, or you've not seen the new updates, go out there, check out Propelio.com for all of your real estate investing needs. I do appreciate it, everybody. Grant, last thoughts? Nope, no last thoughts. Thank you guys for being here and I'll see you next week. All right, guys, have a good one.